the ominous original ending. Jesus Christ's resurrection from the dead three days after his execution through crucifixion is an especially important aspect of modern Christianity. Most people are familiar with this story often retold around the holidays of Good Friday and Easter Sunday. The Gospels each provide slightly discrepant accounts of how after Jesus' death, his body was placed in a tomb which was sealed by a large stone. A group of three, or two, or a single woman, depending on which gospel you are reading, visits the tomb and finds that the massive stone has been rolled away and Jesus' body missing. The Gospels kind of differ with what happened next. The Gospel of Mark's version is especially interesting when you reach this part of the story. Mark 16 states, the three women, one of whom is Mary Magdalene, find a young man clothed in a long white robe sitting, and they get freaked out. He says, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him, as he said to you. Mark 16 verse 8 concludes with, So they went out quickly and fled from the tomb, for they trembled and were amazed. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Apparently, they, the women, do not tell their fellow disciples or anyone of what they saw or were told. Instead, keeping it a secret. Now, here's where things get very, very interesting. In most modern English Bibles, Mark chapter 16 continues after verse 8. Verses 9 through 18 tell of how Jesus himself, back from the dead, appears to first Mary Magdalene. She later tells several disciples who do not believe her. Jesus then appears in front of two unnamed disciples who are once again not believed. Then, for a third time, Jesus appears to all of the eleven remaining apostles at a dinner. Verses 19 and 20 conclude with Jesus finally leaving, ascending into heaven, and sitting at God's right hand concluding with the disciples going out and preaching his message and return to the world. Now, the ending of Mark's gospel has been the source of much textual criticism and debate. Many biblical scholars have found discrepancies that call into question the authenticity of verses 9 through 20. Our oldest and most complete copies of Mark, the Codex Vaticanus and Codex Sinaiticus, both end at Mark 16 verse 8, with the three women departing from Jesus' empty tomb and the man in white, and telling no one of what they saw there. No Jesus appearing to Mary Mag, nor to the two disciples, nor to the eleven apostles at dinner. These manuscripts are not damaged or missing pages or anything. The story just ends there, with the scribe denoting the conclusion of the document by writing kata markon, or according to Mark, after verse 8, and then continuing to copy the Gospel of Luke. Nothing has been erased or removed from the documents here. It is only in later text made around or after 400 AD that we get the long ending of Mark, verses 9 through 20, seen in our modern Bibles. Once again, we are confronted with a predicament. The oldest manuscripts omit verses 9 through 20, while later ones include verses 9 through 20. There is also a rival third ending of Mark that can be found in a select few manuscripts called the short ending, which picks up after verse 8 and states that the women reported their story to Peter and Jesus appears to them. Some later manuscripts only have the long ending, some only have the short, others have a Frankenstein combination of long and short, and finally some have neither, preferring to end at verse 8. Woof, so many competing versions makes you want to pull your hair out, doesn't it? You probably are asking yourself which one was the original ending of the Gospel of Mark. Most scholars agree that verses 9 through 20, that is, the long ending, was almost definitely not a part of the original text of Mark but a later addition. Many aspects, such as the language and style of the verses, as well as all our oldest texts omitting them, support this theory. Most have concluded something similar about the short ending, which only appears in a select few later manuscripts. Now, scholars debate what the original ending of Mark might have been, if it wasn't the long or short endings. Some suggest that a fourth, as of yet unknown ending, after verse 8, has been lost to history. However, others suggest that the Gospel of Mark very well might have originally ended at verse 8, with the other endings being tacked on by scribes centuries later. This changes everything, if true. When one reads the versions of Mark that end at verse 8, it actually makes one's retroactive view of the Gospel very sad. In this version, nobody knows that Jesus has risen from the dead, 
because the women don't say anything because they were afraid, and then it just ends. It's ambiguous, ominous, and abrupt, and sticks with the reader. It's a massive cliffhanger, and raises so many questions. The reader is left to ask, if the women didn't say anything to anyone, and thus nobody was able to pursue Jesus in Galilee, how did the disciples ever learn of the resurrection? Did they even learn? Was what the mysterious man in white said even true? We don't know. The author doesn't tell us. In this version, we don't actually see Jesus alive after his crucifixion, just the empty tomb. We are simply told of it and left to wonder what happened next. The Ascension. Brother Swaggart quotes in his book, Mark chapter 16, verse 16, another place, Mark chapter 16, verse 19, I say, it's not in my Bible. I didn't print this. The Jews didn't print it. The Hindus didn't print it. You Christians, you produced this book. And you are telling me that this is the most up-to-date Bible, going to the most ancient manuscripts. So I look up for Mark chapter 16. I see it ends at verse 8. 9 to 20 is missing. Did I take it out? The Muslims took it out? No. 32 scholars of the highest eminence, backed by 50 cooperating de denominations, they thought it fit that this is another fabrication imposed upon Christendom. And they also threw it out. It's not in my Bible. Therefore, it is not the word of God. If this is the word of God, then that is not the word of God. But I pick up another Bible. Look at this. Look at these two. Brother Swagat, I didn't take it. Look at that. Printed by the same printers. I look and it's there again. What was thrown out, they put it back again. How come? How come? What games are you people playing? Look at this. Back again. This is the 1971 version. Back again. The ordinary people, poor people, they don't know what's going on. What game is being played? Who knows? You read the preface. The learned man, the preacher, he reads the preface, but he won't tell his congregation what he's reading in the preface. In the preface we are told that individuals and two church denominations, they stampeded them, they forced them that they should put it back. If not, they're going to preach against this book to say, look, don't buy this, buy the King James Version. Don't buy this, buy the King James, the most up-to-date Bible going to the most ancient manuscripts. No, 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 don't touch that. This is the safer one because it has everything that you want to preach to catch the fish. It's easier to catch the fish with this than with this, the bait. Like Dale Carnegie, he tells us in his book, how to, uh, he says, how to win friends and inf influence people. He says, I like strawberry and cream. I think most Americans do. But he says, when I go fishing, I put a worm, worm to catch the fish. It's not that I love worms, but this is what the fish loves. So I put worm. So now, if you want to catch fish, you've got to use the right bait. Ascension is now restored to the text, says the preface. By the meantime, while this was being discovered, they made a net profit of $15 million on this version before they could remove it, $15 million. <laughs>